to turn in your Bibles today to Exodus chapter 35. I will be reading verses 21 through 29. Exodus chapter 35, verses 21 to 29. Then the whole Israelite community withdrew from Moses' presence, and everyone who was willing and whose heart moved him came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting, for all its service, and for the sacrifice, sac sacred garments. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, rings, and ornaments. They all presented their gold as a wave offering to the Lord. Everyone who had blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen, or goat hair, ram skins, dyed red, or hides of sea cows, brought them. Those presenting an offering of silver or bronze brought it as an offering to the Lord, and everyone who had acacia wood for any part of the work brought it as well. Every skilled woman spun with her hands and brought what she had spun, blue, purple, or scarlet yarn, or fine linen. And all the women who were willing had the skill spun the goat hair. The leaders brought onyx stones and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastpiece. They also brought spices and olive oil for the light and for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense. All the Israelite men and women who were willing brought to the Lord free will offerings for all the work the Lord through Moses had commanded them to do. Now we'll turn to Acts in the New Testament chapter 4 and I'm going to read to us again this morning verse 32. Acts chapter 4, verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had. These are the words of the Lord for us this morning. Harry. May God be with you as you speak what he's put on your heart to us. Good morning. Go ahead and make sure that you keep uh, your Bibles open. We're going to be pretty much staying in chapter 35 of Exodus today, really delving into uh, what is being said here, what we are being taught about being the people of God. Just want to also uh, remind you about the story. We, we chose this story to be told on this day on purpose, right? Um, and that's because it really has a lot of uh, expression and, and imagery of what's going on in this story. The Israelite people, they're building the tent of meeting, uh, a tent that's going to be traveling around with them where people are going to go and to be able to meet the presence of God, right? Just like the tent of meeting that George Bronk brought here, where people experienced the presence of God and met Jesus. So people are still building tents of meeting, this, this place here at Nestle Mennonite Church, where uh, Ben High and so many others donated funds and skills and talents, not only to build this place, but to do the work of God in this place. This has been a tent, pretty stable tent, but nonetheless, a tent, a place of meeting, a place of meeting the presence of God. And it, 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 it came about because of what people were willing to, to bring and to give. And uh, it's very much been uh, part of the culture here, part of the the vocation, part of the business of what Nestville Mennonite Church has always been and continues to be. So we told that story for a reason, to give us some imagery. And so I won't be uh, telling a whole lot of other stories. We think that that one is enough. So just keep that in mind as we go through this story in Exodus 35. And as we think about um, what 
it is teaching us. Now remember what's going on. The people of Israel have been slaves in Israel for uh, 400 years, a very long time. A lot can happen in 400 years. Um, they have lived there as slaves um, pretty much their, their whole time. They, they entered in, and things were pretty good, um, but quickly it changed, and they've lived now as slaves for 400 years. And so Moses takes them takes them away. They're liberated. They're freed. They're, they're taken out into the desert, and they begin to set up their, their new culture, their new people, their new way of living. And uh, one of the very first things that they're going to do is build this tent of meeting, the tent of the presence of God. And so um, we didn't read it, but if you go ahead and look in verse uh, 4 uh, of chapter 35, Moses begins and he says this. He says, this is what the Lord has commanded. This is what the Lord has commanded. Literally, uh, this phrase in Hebrew is that this is the thing. This, the thing, the, the debar, which is the word, um, literally means business or occupation, acts, matter, case, or something. So what this word debar means is that this is the, is the thing. This is the what. This is the something. This is the business. This is the vocation. This is the new vocation that I am going to want you as the people of God to pursue. Their business had been slavery. That's been their business for 400 years. Um, they've been very successful at their business. They, they've grown to about a million or two million people. Um, but not a very lucrative business, is it now? Um, slavery. You can't own property. Um, you don't have any rights. You, um, you really can't uh, amass any, any kind of wealth. Anything that you might amass, you have to be careful, very careful about um, showing that to anybody because um, you know, if your master finds it, they might take it from you or you might lose it. Uh, this, is, this is the world that they come from, this, this world of, of slavery and having a master over them and, and all of their wealth and all of their work and all of their investments going into someone else. And so Moses says, guess what? This is, here's the word from God. I've got a new business for you. I've got a new vocation for you. I've got a new work that I want you to be involved in. And the business is, is going to be a family business. Okay? It's going to be a, a, a family business, and the, and the business of this family traces all the way back to the Abrahamic covenant where God calls Abraham out of the, the land of the Earl of Chaldeans and, and sends him into the promised land and says what? Family business is going to be that all of the nations in all of the world are going to be blessed by your family. So the family business is, is, is to bring blessing to others. And blessing in the, in the New Testament, in the Old Testament, throughout the entire scriptures, the blessing is, is being in the presence of God. That's the blessing. That's, that's how we are blessed. That's what it always means. And so the family business is, is going to be uh, creating places, creating spaces where peoples of the world are going to be experiencing God. So, this is the why. This is, this is the vocation. This is the new business that you're going to be about. The, 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 the Israelites, as, as sometimes we do as well, they, they kind of get waylaid in their family business, right? Uh, they, they, they take up other businesses and other things and kind of get away from that family business. So, Jesus comes. He has to come back. The son, you know, the rightful heir, the, the CEO of the, the family business um, comes and says, okay, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna set the family business up again, okay? Some, 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 some new uh, business plans. We've, we've got some new, uh, some new strategies that we are going to employ. We're going we're gonna to lay down some pretty clear goals, you know, 
go into the world and preach the gospel and these kinds of things. We're going to lay them out pretty clearly and show you how to do it, right? And then Acts 4, the, 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 the whole experience of Acts 4 is that, is that the, the Holy Spirit comes down and, and fills the, the, the Christians, right? And, and then we get to begin to move um, and enter into the family business. See, our family business is about bringing blessing. And so Acts 4 is, is, is the, the church getting back to the original business of what the Israelites are doing here with the tent of meeting. Okay? Looking at some confused faces, I'm thinking maybe you're not following me. All this family business stuff. Well, let me try to see if I can't help what's going on see the family business is to take some of what you have and give it to build what God wants us to build together that's our family business the family business that that you whether you know it or not agreed to be part of um, is this covenant that God is making this 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 willingness to sort of align our lives freely willingly to to build the places of the presence of God that God wants so that people can experience the blessing of God. There's a truth embedded in this, what we're seeing here in this story, and the the truth, number one, is that God wants some of what you have. God wants some of what you have. But he doesn't want it all. Now, I'm seeing some squirming because for the preacher to say God wants some of what you have, that's a little scary. And and it's probably a little scary and a little uncomfortable uh, for a couple of reasons. Some of us might be a little uncomfortable that we serve a God who wants some of what we have. Okay? So, you know, I've I worked really hard for all this stuff, and yeah, I know that God's brought this blessing in my life, but I'm a little uncomfortable with someone, you know, actually saying, God wants some of what you have. So how, how do we feel about a God that we serve that wants some of what we have? Some of us might, on the other side, might feel a little uncomfortable because we thought we were serving a God who wants all of what we have, right? Right? And we think that's, that's how it ought to be. So resistance, no, no, God wants all of what we have. Well, how's that going to work out? I mean, if you give all of what you have, and if we serve a God that wants all of what you're going to have, you're going to starve. Right? And, and the truth of the scripture is that we have a God who, who just wants some of what we have. Because God wants you to, to enjoy his presence and his, his, his blessing. But he wants us to be responsible with it. He wants us to not totally be all about ourselves. And he wants us to, to use it to bring about justice and mercy and healing and hope in our world. So... God wants some of what we have, but not all of it. And and if somehow we can get a handle on this concept, on this truth, it can bring a huge amount of freedom in our lives as Christians. And it really can help us mobilize to do far more for the kingdom than we ever thought possible. Because we all know, really, that we can't give it all Really, And so, so we struggle with, with these two understandings of God that, that collide. If we get somehow uh, free of that and, and, and begin to live into this, you know, I'm okay with God wanting some of what I have, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to enter into that excited, free, volunteering you know, one thing we can do is we can begin to enjoy what we have without shame and without guilt, you know? God w- longs to be gracious to you. 
God longs to be gracious to you. He doesn't want you to suffer and have a horrible life. He doesn't want, to, want you to feel guilty about every choice that you're making in your life. If, if we're able to, to begin to enter into this, we're going to know that we are living up to God's expectations. You know, one of the reasons we, 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 we're uncomfortable, maybe with me talking a little bit about this, is we don't, we're not really clear exactly about what God's expectations are for us. I mean, I don't know if you experience this, but, but a lot of times I wonder, you know, am I doing enough? Am I doing too much? What, what are God's expectations for me? I mean, I'd like to know that. Because if I knew that I was living up to God's expectations in my life, then I'd be a lot more at peace. I'd be able to relax a little bit more. I'd be able to enjoy the, the, the life that God has given me, and I'd be able to enjoy the people around me a little bit more. Because I would know that I'm living up to God's expectations in my life. And I wouldn't have to worry what people are thinking about me. Whether they think I should be doing more or they think I should be doing less. So we need to know what the true expectations of God are. We would realize that we are not personally responsible to tend to everything that needs tending to in the world. You know, we, we can really get this idea that, you know, it's really up to us. And this, and this theology of God wants all of what I have really is, is pretty heavy duty. And many of us feel like that, that God somehow expects us to tend to every single thing in the world. We're supposed to use everything we have to tend to everything in the world. Well, you're not God. We're not God. You know? And... And if we could somehow understand that, we would realize that it's not up to us individually to tend to everything in the world. It's up to us corporately with God's help and in alignment to God's purposes to do that. But it's not up to you individually. And we need to find freedom from that. And most importantly, we would no longer live as slaves, but we would begin to live as freed people. And that's, that's why this story is so formational and so foundational for the people of Israel. Because it's teaching them this, about what kind of master they are going to serve. They have served a master who expected everything from them every single part of their life and they weren't allowed to enjoy anything that's what the life of a slave is in Egypt and now they're going to serve the Lord this new master their new Pharaoh what kind of Pharaoh is God going to be what kind of master is God going to be same kind no it's a just God. It's a, it's a kind God. It's a merciful God who, of course, wants you to, to be responsible with your life and responsible to your community. But you also get to enjoy. You get to be free. You get to stay free if you follow Yahweh. And so this, 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 this tent of meeting thing, which, which seems like a single act, is, is actually really a paradigm for what it's going to mean to be a follower, to be a Jew, okay? And, 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 and so what, what do they do as, as Moses begins to talk about this new idea, building this tent of presence, this tent of, of meeting? And somehow it seems like they're excited about it, right? It seems like they're, 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 they're empowered by this. It doesn't feel like they're, 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 it's an order, it's a command that's really heavy laden, or at least it shouldn't. Sometimes it does because we, we read what, what is said here in verse 20. Go ahead and skip down to verse 20. It says, Then the whole Israel community withdrew from Moses' presence. Okay, withdrew. When you withdraw for something, from something, what, what, what kind of idea do you get? There's this, and I'm going to withdraw from it. Help me out here. Is it, is it, is it a sort of a good feeling or a bad feeling? I'm going to withdraw. Not good feeling. It's like something bad over here, and I'm going to withdraw. Because uh, 
And a lot of times when we talk about the commands of God, we withdraw from the presence of the commands of God because it's uncomfortable. I say God wants some of what you want, not all of it, some of it, and oh, wait a minute, not sure about that. We, we withdraw, we pull away from that. But, but that's not what the word means. It's how it's translated. I'm a little upset about that. But it's not what it means. The word here, withdraw, is yatsa. Not yatsi, yatsa. Okay? And it means to go forward, to proceed to, to, to go toward something. The word is used 1,068 times in the Old Testament. It's used in Genesis 1, where it talks about the grass coming forth, coming out of the earth. It's used when, when, when uh, the Bible talks about life coming forth out of all of these different places. It's used um, when Noah and his family go forth out of the ark. So they're going from this confined place out into this new world. It's used when it talks about Abraham going forth, going out from the land of the Earl of Chaldeans and going forth into the promised land, this new land. This new place that's going to be filled with milk and honey. Every time it's used, 1,068 times in the Old Testament, it's always about going from a confined place into a place of, of blessing and of life and of openness and of freedom. And so that word is used here. They hear this idea of giving some of what you have to build this place where the presence of God is going to dwell and going to be experienced. And they go forth. They rush to it because they see it as an opportunity for life, as an opportunity to express for the very first time in their life freedom. This is the first time that they get to exercise the freedom that they were given when they came out of Egypt, the very first time. And they are excited about it. They are excited with great joy. They are able to finally participate willingly in something. They get to decide, are they going to do this or are they not? And that is at the core of what freedom is all about, that we get to choose what we will do and what we will not do. And they're given really three opportunities to do that. They're given the wave offering, they're given the heave offering, and they're given the skill offering. So we're going to talk about those three offerings. These are the three kinds of offerings. And you know, we could, we could read through this list, this long list of all of the things that they're, they were giving, given, or they, that they were giving, and all of these times where it talks about offering and it talks about willingness willingly, these kinds of things. And we could assume that, that all of these words of offering and all of these words of willing are the same. And they are not. They are different words and they mean different things. And they're there for different reasons. Okay, And there's actually three of them. Three different kinds of willingness and three different kinds of offerings. The first one is in verse 22. It's called the wave offering, and it's the nobles' wave offering. All who were willing, men and women alike, came and brought gold jewelry of all kinds, brooches, earrings, and the like, and they presented them as a wave offering. Okay? The word, the word wave here that's used means that. It means that they waved it around. Okay? They were taking these this, this gold, the gold that they had gotten, they didn't earn it. They got it as spoils when they came out of Egypt, and, and they were waving it. They, they brought it, and they literally waved it. It's probably um, from this is probably where some of uh, us Christians get this idea, you know, of waving our hands in, in worship. It's one of the places that it comes from. But it was a very visible thing, and all those who were willing, men and women, the word actually means noble, priestly in rank, mind, or character. Um, and so what we get is this idea that it's, it's this very precious and yet fairly small 
offering that's very visible that sort of the somehow the, the, the rich class that is already seeming to be emerging is going to give. The ones who have the gold, they're going to give some of it. They're going to wave it around. And, and, it's, and it's, it's valuable, but it's fairly small because you don't wave around a brick of 500-pound gold. I mean, some people might be able to do that, but not many, right? So it's a very visible, it's a, it's a, it's a wave offering it's small. And, and so, what does the wave offering say? Well, it says a couple of things. First thing it says, I have stuff and I don't need to hide it anymore. Now, how is that helpful? What, what is that all about? Well, it's back to the slave thing again. You know, they had to hide their stuff. And, you know, we know what that's like. We hide our stuff because maybe we're afraid somebody's going to steal it. Um, somebody might think we deserve it might not think we deserve our gold that we have, you know? Maybe someone will think that or expect that we ought to give more of it. You know, if we wave around uh, 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 an earring, two, two pair of earrings that are, you know, gold and have a nice little diamond in them, we wave that around, but, but, but somebody says, well, you know, you've got seven pair, you know, you're just given one. What's up with that? So we're we hesitant. We, we Grown up with this theology of don't let your right hand know what the left one's doing and all of that. But here we go. Here's people waving around their stuff. And it says, you know what? I'm free because I know the expectations of God. And I'm given this. And I'm excited about it. I don't have to hide my stuff. And it also says my master's not going to take it from me if he sees it. They, they had this idea that they had to hide it from their master. And so now they're bringing it to God, and they're bringing some of it, not all of it, but they're bringing some of it, and they, they know that God's not going to steal it from them. He's going to accept it as, a, as, a, as, a, as an offering for, for what it is, as something noble, as something wonderful. And so it says, you know what, I can give freely as a thank you. Because as they were waving these things around, they were also remembering that they didn't, though they earned it, kind of, you know, it was part of the spoils. It was something that God provided them as they left. You know, I think we do a really good job of the wave offering here at Nestville. I mean, we heard a tremendous story. What, what Ben High did, that was a wave offering. The wheelbarrow offering, you know. But, you know, kind of a, a wave offering, Hey, and, and we tell the story over and over again. And, and, that, and we don't see that as, as not letting your right hand know what your left hand is doing because it inspires us. Because it wasn't about pride. It was about humility. It was about willingness. It was about something noble in that story. Isn't there something noble in that story that inspires us and says, you know, I'd like to be like that. That's what the wave offering does. It inspires us to do some incredible things. The next offering is in verse 23. It says, it says this, everyone, and, and that word everyone is ish, okay? Ish is the word uh, for, for man. It's used in Genesis, Genesis 1 and, and ish and isha, right? The man and the woman. Um, it's men as a working class human being. Person. So every working class human being, middle class folk who had all of these different products, things that they had generated as a result of their work, those ish brought this offering. And the offering is teruav, okay? And, and that literally means a heave offering. It's, it's translated as well as the tithe or the 10% of their first fruits. And so this is, this is the expression, this is where the tithe begins, this 10% of what we are giving and what we're, what we're working at. The heave offering says a couple of things. It says, I have an abundance, you know. Um, we get this idea of a heave offering, all this clothing. Um, have you ever taken clothes and stuff to, to Goodwill? Um, some of us brought a whole bunch of stuff for the, for the, uh, the, the uh, yard sale, 
right? We, we do some fundraisers, and, and we... Did anybody bring st stuff? Kind of... Uh, the wave offering, and then you got the heave offering. I'm going to bring some of my stuff. It's a medium-sized offering, you know, and you kind of... Uh, yeah. There you go. There's my offering, okay? It's not all your stuff, but it's about 10% of the stuff and 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 we give it because we recognize that we have a, we have enough we actually have more than enough and so so giving this 10% giving this heave offering says to us and to others you know what we have received enough from God we've gotten an abundance from God and we recognize that and we don't give to get we give because we've gotten give because we've gotten. It says God has provided enough. So I have this big pile of extra stuff I can offer. That's what the heave offering says. So let's talk a little bit about the heave offering at Nestville. Um, currently, um, if our budget giving, as I said, the heave offering, the tithe offering is about 10%. Okay, It's probably going to make some of you uncomfortable. I hope not. Certainly not my intention here. What I'm trying to do is, is just to give us a picture, an idea of kind of what the Scripture has to say in practical senses about what's going on among us. But we know that the tithe is a, is a 10%. And so if our budget, which is about $760,000, is that right, a year? Dave It's nodding, yes. So, okay. I did check it out before, but it's always nice, you know, get someone official to say it. Um, if, if that's true, and if we are giving the, the heave offering, you know, as we're invited to by God, then as a group, and that's about 527 people at this point, somewhere around two and 300 family units, um, we're making about $7.6 million a year. That's, that's a phenomenal amount of money. Isn't it? As a group, we're making, if we're all giving 10% that much, that much money, that's incredible. That, that, that gives us an idea of, of the resources that we have among us as the people of God and, and what we might be able to do if we begin to think about how do we direct those towards building the places that God wants us to build. I think we're doing pretty good at that, and I really don't know all the statistics because we don't keep track of things that way. Um, but what we do know from averages and, and, and averages of what's going on in the church is that, that most churches aren't giving consistently 10%, you know, as, as, a, as a whole body. That actually most churches, most faith-based groups are giving about 2.5% of, of what the groups are making. I did some research. That's general. Frankly, I think we're doing better as a church. Okay? I, I think that this is an incredibly giving group of people. And so I, I think that we are above average. We're certainly not below average. But let's say we are average. It means that we're probably making $30.4 million a year as a group of people. Based on our budget, based on our giving. And if we we're given 2.5%, that's an incredible amount of money. And it is possible because if, you know, you do the figures, two to 300 family groups or 527 people, it's about fifty, sixty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000 a person, $100,000, $150,000 a family unit. It's possible. Certainly some people are making less, some people are making more. But that's an incredible amount. Imagine what might be possible if we're anywhere even close to that. What might be possible if we were inspired by a compelling vision to, to build places where people could experience the presence of God in deeper and deeper ways? We would truly become a blessing to many, many nations. And I'm not, I'm not saying you have to do this, and I'm not saying... I'm not saying this to make you feel guilty or bad about what you're giving because, you know, I believe a lot of you are just 
really extending yourselves. And we thank you for that. We do. But I, but I wonder, I wonder, are we inspired? Are we, are, we, are we really going forward into the vision that God has for us to continue the ministry of Jesus? And, and if we're anywhere close to this huge number, $30 million a year, what might be possible? just entered into that heave offering just a little bit more. The skill offering, sorry, let's move back here. The skill offering is the last offering that we'll talk about this morning. It says, every skilled woman spun her with her hands and spun what she had spun and talks about all these things and then later all the Israelite men and women who were willing are and the word willing here is, is volunteering it's not the noble anymore it's the volunteering but it ties to that and it says the ones who volunteer are the noble ones among us um, this, this skilled you, you would, you, we need to understand a little bit of what it means it's talking about being skillful in technical work and wise and learned in trades prudent ethically and Religiously, it's 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 a it's it's this offering of 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 not only the stuff that we've been able to acquire, but but our abilities, our skills, and and our wisdom, and and our tr- the things that we can train and help people do. And the skill offering says, and, and it's saying this for the people of Israel: I am the master of my labor. I am the master of of my labor and and I get to choose who I work for. Remember they were slaves and now they get to choose. And so I am choosing to work for God because God freed me and won't take my work for granted. That's what the when you volunteer in in, in some sort of ministry or some sort of work of the church or somewhere else, you're saying these three things. I have skills. I have abilities. I get to choose where I direct them and what I, what I do with them. And guess what? I'm going to choose to give them to the Lord because I know that God's going to use them to build something greater than myself. We have an incredible skill offering here at Nashville. I mean, we have people with all kinds of abilities and skills. It's, it's just phenomenal. Huge numbers of people that volunteer. Huge hours that, that, that we volunteer. Did you know that last year the, the council directors, um, commission directors, uh, did a study and they averaged that 24,363 hours were given to voluntary service at Nestville last year. 24,000 hours. Can you imagine? Did you know that, that that's what it took to do everything that we did last year. If again we divide that by the people that we have, it's about 46 hours per person a year. Right? So about an hour a person a week. And that's giving everybody six weeks of vacation. Because we all need a vacation, right? We all need time off. So about an hour a week. Tremendous, incredible what's going on here. It's phenomenal. But, but we also know um, something else, is that the generally average, 20% of the people do about 80% of the work in a church, right? Any of you feel like that? Don't raise your hand. Pretty much the average. So if we do our math, people, 20% of 527 is about 105 people. You know, and, and we're kind of there. You know, we look at what's going on. Work, 24,000 hours. Uh, 80% of that, that's almost 20,000 hours, right? So really probably more of what's going on, what's going on with our, our skill offering here is that about 100 or so people are given about four hours a week. And in fact, I know some people who, gave, who give on a regular basis 16 hours of voluntary work at our church every single week. They're here when I'm on vacation. Remarkable. If you were part of VBS you probably gave 16 or more hours in one week. Created to Praise is coming up. 
That's probably 40 hours a week. Darlene, where's Darlene? Is that a lot of hours in a week? Yes, not every week, but it's a lot of hours. So we have these, we have these groups of people that are giving tremendous amount of work. But imagine what might be possible if we all thought about being part of all of these things. Not that we need to take responsibility for everything, but what if we gave some of our life, more of our life if we're not doing anything, to building a place where people could experience the, the blessings of God? Well, what would happen? No one would be overextended, and everything that God wants to be built would be built. God wants us as the church to enter into the same kinds of things that the people of God are entering into here. Participating with noble hearts and in great desire, moving towards this vision of making a place where people, people can be touched and transformed by the presence of God. That's what Nestle has always been about, and you are doing a fabulous job. So don't, don't feel like I'm getting on you today really not my intention I want you to notice the incredible wonderful things that we have already done but I also want to encourage us to think about where we are with this are, are we participating in this and you can cut it up however you want to I don't care it doesn't matter but the invitation is still there to exercise your freedom in response to a master who's not going to take advantage of you Will you consider that? Will you do that? If we, if we would, I believe we could do four times more than what we're doing now. Just by the little statistics that we've thought about today. Can you imagine how Lancaster County would be different if we were doing four times more than what we're doing now? It'd be incredible. It would be phenomenal. The worship team is going to lead us, I believe, in a, in a song of response. At the end of your pews, there is a, a little card. And uh, it says my name on the bottom of it. Um, don't get too caught up with that. You don't have to put your name down if you don't want to. Um, but, but as you think about how you are participating in in exercising your freedom in regards to some of these offerings. I'd like, to, like you for, for you to honestly reflect. And, 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 and if you, you feel like you'd like to, to really enter into these things more, you can put a check or you can put a yes, you can put an amen, you can put a number, whatever you'd like to do there. In particular, we really need skill offerings here. People to... to, to to participate in what's going on and even to offer training um, in many different ways. If you do put down a skill offering, something that you, you particularly do well and you'd like to really align that with, with what's going on in the church, um, it would be helpful to have your name because we do want to contact you because we need your help. We really do. We, we need your help. You think things could be done better around here? I, I can't argue against that. We would like to do better, but, but we need help to do better. We just do. So if you're interested in offering a skill offering, please do put your name down. Um, and you will get contacted, and we will allow you to help build the great things that God wants to build here at Nashville.